You're listening to the 2017 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Programme. This session features Elizabeth Easter in conversation with Michael Ann Forster. So my name's Naomi Arnold, I'm the uh, Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Coordinator and it's my great pleasure to welcome Elizabeth to Nelson. She's been quite busy here, she had a um, performance, what do you call it, performance? A reading yesterday of, yeah, of her new play, um, Birds of a Feather, about the work of our own Perrine Moncrief, um, which went very well. And um, she's going to be chatting about this gorgeous new volume, Bird Words, which has just been released, so we're probably one of the first people to have you here talking about it, maybe. Um, and interviewing her will be Michael Ann Forster, who's a well-known playwright. Um, he's been in New Zealand since 1978? Three. Three, sorry. Um, so I'm really excited to have you both here to talk about how Elizabeth put together this, this volume. And I just wanted to say a big thanks to Paige and Blackmore for being our uh, sponsor. We wouldn't be able to do this without them, so please support them. <laughs> um, and this session will also be podcast. They'll be released in about a month's time. Um, on iTunes and probably through the festival website, um, so you'll be able to relive all the magic. Um, so Elizabeth's actually an Auckland-based actor, award-winning playwright and a journalist, um, and I'm sure she's got some... <laughs> we can have a really good time listening to her uh, experiences, so thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. <laughs> oh, well, tēnā koutou nā mau ki tēne whakawhiti whiti kōrero. Uh, greetings and welcome to this session. Um, and tēnā koe, Elizabeth. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. <laughs> yes, good. Thank you. Kata <laughs> um, So I'm really pleased that you're all here and I've got lots to ask Elizabeth. And the first question that I have for her, for you, is for those who haven't actually read the introduction to the book, could you just sort of run us through how the book came into being? Yes, so I um, was at home. I sit at home a lot of the time writing uh, articles for newspapers and magazines. And I also at the time was uh, Sam Hunt, the poet's manager, which is, a, um, is an unusual job. For <laughs> I don't know how I got that one with my skill set because I'm not very managerial. And in this one particular day, Sam Hunt called just to talk about some gig that might be coming up. And in the course of the phone call, he did a poem at the end of the call, which he often did. They were always, sometimes him, sometimes Yates, but it was always a treat. And this particular day was a poem about a shag. And then um, later that day, because I was writing a story for North and South about the hee hee or the stitch bird, and um, the guiding manager there knew I was writing this, so she sent me a poem by Ursula Bethel about the stitch bird, thinking it would inspire me. And then, um, actually, I got an email about the hee hee the other day from Marianne, and she has a research friend who's going around the country extracting their sperm which just makes your mind boggle, doesn't it? How do you get it out? Tiny little bird, hugest testicles, uh, testicles per any creature on earth for, per body um, ratio. And if they were a human man, they'd weigh 27 kilos. I just find them fat. See, see birds are fascinating. We're, that's where I'm going with this. And then my friend Rowena came over and she, um, I said, oh, I've had a very birdie day. And she stood, launched into the albatross poem. And I was like, oh my gosh, someone should do a bird book. So I wrote to the um, head honcho of, Penguin, random penguin house, and just she has no idea of who I am. She had never met me before, and I just figured out her email from the email protocol of Penguin, and wrote her this email saying bird words in the subject title, and she wrote back in less than twelve minutes, and said, "I think that's not a bad idea. Um, I'll talk to you know, I'll talk to my people because it always comes down to money." And then just quite quickly, it they said, "All right, go on." And it was going to be poetry in my head because the day started with poetry and then there was just prose and non-fiction and stuff. And so it grew and was born and hatched. Oh, what a happy story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so there's actually 62 contributing authors uh, in the anthology, at least if I counted right. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, real heavyweights in New Zealand literature. You know, there's something... By Janet Frame, Alan Kurno, Sam Hunt, as you said, uh, Viti Ihamira, Michael King, Fiona Farrell, Laura Sedman, you know, the list just goes on. So, um, some names I didn't know, but most of them are absolute, you know, standouts in our country's literature. So, obviously, you couldn't get in touch with people who are no longer with us, but did you have a personal connection with anybody else? Um, I did actually. I, so some friends are in there, and, um, and my mother is, is in there, because she's a really good writer, 
No, I mean, actually, I might have been nepotistic. But no, she was marvellous. And she um, had a book that she wrote called Islands of the Gulf in the 1960s, which was the book of a um, documentary series of the same name. She made New Zealand's first ever documentary series ever, all about the Hodaki Islands. And Islands of the Gulf has this beautiful chapter set on Hoturu, or Little Barrier, which is a sanctuary and has been since 1893. And it's just beautiful. So I really enjoyed putting that in. And a man who um, had given me a lot of assignments for the listener, Mark Broach, I was very glad for once in my life to give him a job instead of him <laughs> giving me them. Yet the loveliest thing about it was, is that while I couldn't include everybody that was on my long list, because I know as a freelancer, I'm constantly sending people suggestions and more often than not, people say no, sometimes quite abruptly, sometimes not at all, just silence. And so I know how lovely it is when someone either out of the blue or after a conversation says yes. And I felt like I was this, you know, 62 people, some of them gone, who I said yes to, and I loved that. It was cool. A very good feeling. A yes woman. Uh, so did you just put, when you were trying to decide, you know, where to get these um, bits, did you just put birds in Google to see what would happen? Or was there... I didn't, or, I didn't do that. Or, or can you sort of talk us through the process of actually making the selections? There were quite a few that seemed quite obvious. You know, there were some pieces that you just know just because you know literature but then when I went to friends houses I would look through all of their um just their New Zealand literature section and there was a Frank Sargison piece that I found at Robin Malcolm's house and I was like we took pictures of that and then there was um I went to the library in Auckland the city library which is amazing like and all the librarians look like kind of they're fashion models or something they kind of glide around can I help you can I help you and it was like yes you can where's the New Zealand section where's the bird section and there wasn't one um but they, or well, obviously the ornithology, but I went to the poetry section and I looked right through the New Zealand section. <laughs> really, really, this is such a flicking through, looking for birds. Just, I wanted to see Pukeko and Duck and Fantail and I was just trying to see if birds would catch my eye. And then I'd leave for the day and I'd put a bookmark in the shelves and come back to where I was. But it was amazing too. I wrote to um, every writer I spoke to would then say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And Lawrence Fernley was particular instrumental with that because she told me about your wonderful Perrine Moncrief and so that's how the play that I've been working on was born out of Lawrence Fernley suggesting Perrine. So yeah lots of suggestions and the New Zealand Society of Authors which is a, um, an organisation of really flash writers and also people who just like being you know like probably less you know of the top of their fields but they I just said open slather send me your stories and your things and some of them who I'd never heard of and would never have found uh, were just stunning so including a 12 year old called Abby Mason ah oh, that poem yeah nice nice cool. nice okay um so did you have any special hoops you had to jump through to actually after you found the material any any exciting hoops that you want to tell us about? <laughs> People were actually, nobody said no. It was finding some of the um, the estates that like we never actually found. We're probably more likely to be able to find it now we've been here. Um, Perrine's next of kin. And Penguin has a very big machinery to find people and they look through lawyers and all sorts of things. So it was, um, there were one or two people that weren't easy to get their check to them. But we, you know, made every effort. And also for Perrine, we made a donation to Forest and Bird. But there were no special hoops. Everyone just said yes. There was no one who was, you know, tricksy or... And Owen Marshall, who you think would be quite sort of confident, he sent three or four samples through and he goes, oh, look, you know, they're probably... And if you don't like them, and that's all right. And it's like, you're Owen Marshall. Goodness me. I don't, I'd like to do two of yours. But <laughs> it was really lovely, I thought, how, um, how, how just self-effacing some of them were. Writers are always glad to be asked, I think, mm. to be included in anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about, um, you might want to hold, shall we hold the book up? Um, Lily Daff, who did the illustrations for the book. This is the most beautifully produced book, by the way. It's it got this gorgeous little um, orange ribbon in it. And oh, Elizabeth I Elizabeth will tell it. you how much she loves the way the book feels. And also, too, um, the my uh, friend Diane, she said, what about the collective nouns of birds, which are super groovy, as I'm sure you'll all agree. And I had them as a story. And then the nice penguin people said, why don't we put them on the end papers? And I didn't know what end papers were, but they're these things. And so these elegant dark green things have got all of the, a chain of bobolinks 
a charm of finches, a parliament of owls, or oh, wisdom of owls here, a watch of nightingales, a wedge of swans. Oh, lovely. I love that. Or oh, read some more. <laughs> <laughs> That's the weirdest one. Let's see. Um, a scoop of pelicans. Ah. It's actually, it's getting very kind of um, chips, isn't it? Got wedges, <laughs> we've got scoops. <laughs> I'm hungry. Yeah. So anyway, I just, all of those little things. So you're going to tell us about li Lily Daff. So oh, people yes. might not realise that the, the book's actually got beautiful illustrations in it. They're all in black and white. Now, I'm assuming that they were done originally as oil paintings in colour? They or? were done as sort of sketches not unlike this for um, Forest and Bird. I'll and they up, illustrated Perrine's um, New Zealand Birds and How to Watch Them, which was first printed in 1925. And Lily um, painted entirely from skins, from dead birds. And she had this little trick, apparently, where she did a little white dot in the eyes, and that would bring them to life. And that's quite a um, an animating technique when you're painting a corpse. <laughs> Any time you find yourself painting a corpse. So every time there's a new selection, you get a new lovely, lovely mm. Lily Daff um, I, yeah, lithograph. I'm not quite sure what it well, is. Well, if any of you ever have, some of you probably have Perrine's book, The Field Guide to New Zealand Birds, and they're in colour in there. Because obviously production, you know, you can't just have colour pages all through a book, but um, for budgetary reasons. But it's, they're beautiful. I just love looking at them. I think she had a really, you know, she could have given Buller a run for his money. Oh, that's probably sacrilegious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, just a minute. I just... I saw a little bit of movement outside the window there. I just want to check. Oh my goodness, Elizabeth, there is a bird out there. Quick, have a look. What is it? I don't know. God, I'm a terrible ornithologist. Oh, that's interesting. What do you think it is? Oh. I think it's the bluebird of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> lost it. Well, we'll put it away and see whether another bird flies past the window. But we'll do that later. I couldn't resist bringing these field glasses along because I wanted to ask Elizabeth whether in writing about birds she actually was a bird watcher or not. So are you? I don't sit around and, like, as Perrine instructs for hours on end watching what's happening in my garden, but I'm really fond of the birds that happen to... I have a bird feeder. I have in the winter months I put out sugar water for the honey eaters. I visit Tiri Tiri Matangi re regularly and Hotudu and various bird sanctuaries. I'm for the um, Because I'm often a travel writer, I often get sent on trips to bird sanctuaries and so I've upskilled in the course of my um, my writing life but as you get older I don't know if this is something other people can relate to I've become much more interested in my natural world as um, I'm, I'm more keen on gardening you're more likely to find me preserving peaches and you know I feel like I'm getting closer to earth now that I'm more mature I was going to say closer to the grey, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll make wonderful compost. <laughs> you will. So let's play a little game of imagination right now, okay? So you imagine that you're in this wonderful little town with a little wonderful independent bookstore, and time has no boundaries. Past, present, and future are all kind of whirling around out there. So who are your eyes shut? You're imagining oh, this. Oh, I imagine with my eyes Wait, open. Oh, okay, okay. okay. No, then you can then. Who do you see walking into the bookstore buying your book? Someone who doesn't know what to get their aunt for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I think it's one of those books that you also, I mean, people will want to buy for themselves, but I think it's quite handy to give someone a book. You give them a present, and then you borrow it back from them. I don't know if that <laughs> resonates with anybody. But I do, it feels like a lovely gift book. You know that lovely, because when they unwrap it, they, you know, I mean, it's all very well to give someone a novel they might read once. This is the sort of book you would probably dip into regularly or just when you felt you wanted to have a little, you know, flight of fancy. It's yes, a, yeah. a little bird moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think it would make a lovely gift. Mm. Mm, okay. Christmas is only... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that wasn't supposed to be yeah. a sort of commercial would, thing, but okay. Who was I thinking? Who would you think would come in and buy it? Did you have a picture in your head? Close your eyes. Hmm. Bob Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. There's a lot of rich material there. And then he could win a Pulitzer. <laughs> Yeah, we could go there. I'll work on that one. Okay. So. Um, now, another thing um, is a very well-known Nelsonian, obviously. You've talked about her, Perrine Moncrief, um, and yesterday did a playwright um, workshop of, of that. Can, I think, did, did you guys go to that yesterday? How many people here went to that? So Wow, cool. Yeah, that's nice. Well, for the people who don't know about it, would you like to just tell us a little bit about what you're doing and maybe tell them about our marvelous moment with June Carson, Oh, yes, that and was lovely. And the peregrine. I have to get my, yes. my, my front of my cardigan, actually. Okay. My jacket is right. Um, so, yesterday, when Michael, on Monday, Friday, sorry, the days Friday. are blending into each other, um, Michael Ann picked me up from the airport and took me to meet a woman called June Carson, who was, uh, okay, Perrine Moncrief, first of all. I imagine most of you know who she is, being Nelson people. But in the course of this writing, as I said, Lawrence Fernley suggested I read various people, including Perrine Moncrief, whom I'd never heard of, um, to my shame. And uh, the more I found out about her, the more I thought she sounded amazing. And Lawrence said in the course of our um, exchanges, you should write a play about her. And I didn't want to write a play. But I said she should write it and that I would be in it because I thought that would be really, really easy. And then... Um, and she said, I don't know how to write a play. You know how to write a play because you won a prize-winning play award just two years ago. I couldn't argue with that. <laughs> and so I ended up just slowly, this, you know, stepping closer towards this idea of writing this script. And then with Bronwyn Bent, my lovely producer, we went to a thing called PANS in Auckland, which is the, I don't even know what it stands for, but you go and present plays you want to put on tour or have people pick up. And so we presented a play that we'd already done called Seed, which is actually going on tour next year. And we also said that we'd like to create this one woman show about Perrine Moncrief with really no idea of what that would entail. And the lovely Charlie from this arts festival said that he would quite like to see it for this festival. And he, in his first kind of approach, suggested that the play would be ready to go. <laughs> and I nearly had a heart attack. I was like, God, no. And so for the last sort of five or six months, I've just spent a couple of, you know, possibly an hour or so each day on average reading and talking to people and trying to gather as much information as possible. And then um, it's, it's at, at the early stage of a play, you've usually got way too much stuff and then you have to refine it. So I'm at the too much stuff stage as those of you who will have seen it yesterday will know. But then also having met all these amazing people, I realize I haven't got enough of all the stuff. So then Michael Ann picked me up from the airport and took me to a woman who considered Perrine to be her other mother, because her mother and Perrine were very good friends. And she got out all sorts of photographs and letters that Perrine had actually typed on, um, I don't know if you remember, quarto paper, that quite fine and the sort of thing that comes out of a typewriter that was very much from the letters my mother wrote to me all my life. And um, it was just wonderful. And then the sleeve, uh, the uh, front of a cardigan that Perrine had so um, spun the wool and knitted this and she hadn't quite finished it before she died. And so holding on to this and knowing that Perrine's own hands made it is really special. So yes, I'm in the stage of this play. It's very early days, but it feels like more people should know about her. And I love the idea of, of after, you know, all the good work that she's done is that she stays her work and also her ethos because that was what came out yesterday was that, yes, she was pushing vigorously for the environment before it was fashionable, but we are even more in dire need of people like her to stop, you know, progress from destroying us. So I feel like there's a, um, you know, it's, it's all very well being a, a, a nice little story, but it's more than that. Mm, so we can look forward to seeing that at next year's Arts Festival, All Going Well, here in Nelson. <laughs> yeah. You might just about have a yeah. heart attack. No pressure, but yeah. yeah. Um, now, another thing I wanted to ask you about um, is 
there was a piece in the book about magpies by um, Carl de Fresne, um, and he talked about homicidal Banks Peninsula birds repeatedly attacking cy cyclists on the summit road, um, or talk, uh, attacking the cyclists who were going around uh, Lake Topo and the cycle challenge there. I mean, I've certainly, when I lived in Christchurch, the magpies used to regularly attack me. Um, so I guess that's my way of saying that, you know, we think of birds as, you know, little friendly little buddies of ours. But, you know, there's a dark side, I suppose, in both the writing about birds and in the topic of birds from a lot of different perspectives. And I wondered whether you might talk to us about maybe some of the darker pieces in the book. Um, you know, there's not only lovely little light poems. For example, the piece by um, Lawrence about the not from the novel Reach, about the shag in the crevice in the sea, or you might think of some other things that you'd like to say about uh, darkness and birds. Darkness and birds. Well, birds aren't, I mean, they are lovely and, and feathery, but they're actually quite vile creatures, a lot of them. Into, I mean, they're nice to look at, and they obviously are absolutely essential for, you know, forests and things like that. But what I've learned about birds in a lot of the, um, the stories I've written and talking to ornithologists is that they're incredibly omnisexual. They have no care as to who they, um, pretty much it's non-consensual a lot of the time. And, and, to, and yeah, there's, there's no um, kind of morals in that department. And they also, actually, that's another thing about the hee hee. They're the only bird in the world to copulate face to face. I just find there's so much fascinating about them. But they also, um, they, the reason why the pukeko is so um, unthreatened is because they're one of the fewer birds, you know, most birds don't breed in community groups. But all the adults look after the chicks, all the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents, so that they are much more protected by that particular sort of part of their culture. But I, it's a funny thing, our birds are, I mean, I still completely love them, but they're not all sitting around drinking cups of tea. What, can you talk about uh, the pieces in the book, particularly that Lawrence uh, Fernley one? I just had a long time since I Oh, that. okay. That's the one where I love the whole she, book. she tries to basically save a, a shag. shag inside the crevice of a rock and it doesn't work. Yeah, so it's a very powerful piece of writing. So, I mean, if you think that you're going to read the book and every this, that you're going to get a lot of nice poetry about happy birds, you're going to be disappointed. But I don't think you will be disappointed because it's actually quite powerful. Mm -hmm. Some of it's writing. quite somber about quite you know, somber, the, um, yeah. birds that are no longer with us or, you know, birds that are on the brink of extinction. There's a lovely mm. black robin piece and the, there's a neat little play, um, an excerpt from it. Well, actually, it is a whole very short play about the huia. And Which we'll have a look at. Oh, yes, we can have a look at that. You'll need to get it. Have you got a copy? I do. Oh, good. Um, the, the, they, they don't want to be objectified for their body parts because the huia is one of the only birds that's beak goes, or actually the only bird in the world that the man and the woman have different sorts of beaks and that they, obviously in a very sort of heteronormative world, um, they work together, one of them boring and the other one burrowing so they can feed. But... Um, yeah, these who are were very cross about being wanted for their feathers and their beaks and not their personalities. Uh, part of the charm of the book, I think, is that there are some avant-garde pieces in it, and this little huya playlet is one of them. And Elizabeth and I thought we might just do a tiny bit of that little playlet. Because it's very short. It's very short. Would you like to hear a little bit of the playlet? So we just have to get ourselves organized to get... It's on page 78, I think, of the book. Um, so this is written by Claire O'Loughlin, and it's called Four Huyas, but there's only two Huyas up here right now. Elizabeth and I will have to read two parts each. Which numbers would you like to do? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I just want the last line there when we're, where we're going to You stop. want the last this line. It's such a great line. Could I use that other book that's down there? Just borrow it, please. Thank it's you so much. It's only five pages long, you know. Thank you so much. So, so Claire did this for... Um, a museum um, interactive thing, didn't she? Mm. Well, I'm not quite sure what. I don't think it's been on the stage, but it's been staged in a museum. And it, we just thought it was very clever. That's a conversation lovely. for four women. So you want to be, uh, let's see. So I'd be one in three because okay, I prefer Okay, you'd be numbers. one in three. Okay. For no good reason. All I right. understand that is completely ridiculous. Okay. What is it with people who feel like your body belongs to them? 
I mean, just because it's 1901 and my tail feathers are all the rage in London and everyone wants to make jewellery out of my beak, do I go around assuming that I can have your hair for my hat? Do I ask to wear your teeth like a necklace? No, I don't. Yeah, of course not, because it's rude. I mean, yes, we are female hooia, and that means our beaks just happen to be curved. It's evolution. Exactly, it's evolution. I didn't just wake up one day and decide to put on a curved beak so I'd get all this attention. But also, you know that even if you did, that still doesn't make it okay to leer at you all the time. That doesn't make you feel good. Oh my God, it so doesn't. Just yesterday, I was flying to the river and some guy called out nice curves ooh. that look even better hanging around my ooh, neck. Oh, oh my God, that's horrible. Ooh, ooh, how did you respond? What did you say? No, I didn't say anything. I really wanted to, but you know how you always think of everything you should have said afterwards? Oh, totally. So, um, so I, you know... What? I just pooped on him and left. <laughs> that's amazing. Good on you. Good on you. You go bird. You're four. Oh, I'm four. Oh, yeah. And don't feel bad about not saying anything. I mean, those situations are really intimidating. Especially when you know that they just want to taxidermy you. I know. Yeah, exactly. It's like they're, oh, yeah, I'm just trying to give you a compliment. Can a guy can even give a bird a compliment these days? But turning me into an object is literally the definition of objectifying, right? Yeah, who we are, are not objects. Who we are, are not, not objects. objects. We, we are, are living, living breathing, breathing birds. birds. My beak is my beak. <laughs> and my feathers are my feathers. My body is my body. Yeah, and I know I love my body. It's a good body. It's a functional body. My tail feathers aren't for pretty hats. They're for flying. My beak isn't curved so it can become fancy jewelry. It's curved so I can build my nest and hunt my food and feed my young. But everyone else acts like we exist for their pleasure and nothing else. You know the phrase I really hate? Ruffle her feathers. Oh, I hate that one. How about calm down, chick? Oh, it's just gross. It's like we're nothing but trophies. Yeah, and then when we do die out, they're all going to be like, it was their fault. They were too pretty. They were too tempting. Oh, gross. So wrong. So bird blaming. Bird blaming? What's bird blaming? Uh, you know, bird blaming when it's the bird's fault when she gets hunted. How does that figure? Oh, you know, because our curves are too curvy and we shouldn't have gone out wearing such long, pretty feathers. Oh, that's disgusting and it doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. Huya are not the cause of hunting. Hunters are the cause of hunting. Yeah, all of that how to teach your huya not to get hunted crap. Did you guys get that growing up? Oh, totally. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That is a perfect example of bird blaming. We shouldn't be taught how to be not to be hunted. Hunters need to be taught not to hunt. Well, then, we need to do some re-education. What are you suggesting? We should teach people what they should be doing rather than just telling them what they shouldn't be doing. That's right. I mean, right now we're in this situation where we're almost extinct because humans think that the only way to get to know a bird at all is to catch her. And that all comes from this lie that society has taught them that you have to own and control everything in order to enjoy it. Yeah, right. So like what to do tips. Yeah, some who are your positive advice. No bird blaming. How not to exterminate the hooya. Yeah, great idea. So, like, the first tip would be... Uh, like, when you feel the urge to go and catch a bird, um, have a cup of tea instead? Yeah. And, and when your fingers itch for your rifle, sit on your hands and shout very loudly, Help! Help! I'm a hunter and I have a problem! <laughs> and when your mates suggest a hunting trip, um, suggest a game of risk instead. Shoot some pool. Oh, not some birds. Have some drinks. Have a chat. Talk about your feelings. Don't be a dick. But that really is it. People have to start by not being dicks. Shall we stop now? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know yeah. we were going to do that. We just made that up. Okay. That's so cool. So that was one of the lovely suggestions that, you know, when you get two playwrights up here, this is what you have to expect. <laughs> okay. Now, um, would you, uh, now I'd really love you to talk about your mother, the documentary maker, and the actor, Shirley Maddock, because you told me when we were having a little chat in the car that you're career actually really has followed in your mother's footsteps and I was really interested in that so can you talk about that please yeah I was really lucky I mean I don't know we all wonder where nature and nurture um fit for people and how we turn out and I wonder how I got to be an actor who became a playwright who became a journalist who started doing things with books and stuff and 
and I think it's because my mother, from um, all through my life, I'd seen a woman have that career, even though she had it before she had her children. And I somehow ended up so in her footsteps, it's not funny. So I started as an actor. I went, um, I left school and I studied law and I realized that I was not going to be Portia from the Merchant of Venice, mm. no time soon. And so I sort of segued from the law to drama school and some parents might have said, oh, darling, you sure you don't want to get that law degree? <laughs> but mum and dad too, they, she always understood that it was, a, you know, I mean, it wasn't the safest career, but it, was a, it wasn't an impossible, ridiculous career. So I went off and did acting for a while and simultaneously sort of sideways into radio and that's how mum... She, when mum came back from being doing rep in London after she left New Zealand, she came back and worked in broadcasting and she was here um, just as television was starting to take off. So she, you know, sideways in from radio to television and nobody had made television in New Zealand at all and yet she'd been on a Fulbright scholarship to America and just before on the Royal Tour and had studied, um, sort of studied, um, worked in television for a while in New York but she was actually working for some gangsters, she didn't realise this and their um, television making efforts were a front for their criminal um, <laughs> carrying on. So she wrote this lovely novel about that called With Gently Smiling Jaws, which I read now and I think it's just so beautiful. I mean, she's such a good writer. Well, she was. She died 16 years ago. But, um, and then she, in the course of working in television, she went off to Rikino Island just for a couple of days because she had a bit of a broken heart. And she went, oh, this island is just full of stories. And at the time she was there, it was run by an organization called the um, United People's Organization, which was headed by a man... Dr. Maxwell Rickard, who was a stage hypnotherapist, a clinical psychologist who had bought his degree from a, you know, nowhere. And he wanted to start a philanthropic organization on the island for unwed mothers, unstable octogenarians, just like, but really all he wanted was to get a license for his nightclub in town. It was just bonkers. So mum went back to work the next, on Monday and said, I'd really like to make a doco series about these islands. They're so full of stories. And bonker people. <laughs> really, really bonker people. So having never made a documentary before, she and her cameraman, Don White, set off in Fred Ladd's Land, seaplane, who some of you might remember, Captain Fred Ladd, for flying under the Auckland Harbour Bridge, and just made a documentary series. And there was so much stuff in that first series that she had the overflow went into this beautiful book that's just been republished called Islands of the Gulf. And I have just remade her documentary series for TV One, which will go on screen early next year. And so I feel like my mother, without meaning to, left me almost like a, I say it's not been an entirely smooth road, but you know, she left me a map and I could follow and, and figure out what to do with my life by looking at my mother's life. And it's been fabulous. And I'd really like to thank her and say, Oh, mum, you know what? 16 years after you die, you've got a TV series on screen, your books come back out, and you're in this amazing anthology. <laughs> so that's And been... I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just delighted. Yeah, it's one I'd of the treasures of my life. I'd just love it if you read a section of that from your mom's book. Um, I would love book. to do it's that. It's a really beautiful piece. Okay. Where is she? From Islands of the Gulf. And in her little, um, the bit where it says, like, the um, the the author of notes for everybody, and I wrote in her one, I just said at the end of it, and coincidentally, she is also the mother of the editor of this anthology, because I was just so chuffed with her. Right, 137, here we come. So this is from Islands of the Gulf, and it's the chapter set on Hoturu, which is Little Barrier Island. I might do my mother's voice. No, I won't. <laughs> Mum did a really BBC kind of when she was on the radio and stuff. We used to mock her because she used to put on a special voice. Do the, do the voice, do the voice. While I am fond of birds and enjoy looking at them, I am an unskilled bird watcher and worse still, an unlikely, an unlikely one. As you will see when I tell you of a short expedition led by Roger and David to look for a stitch bird. We started up the slope behind the homestead. Before it became a sanctuary, this part of the island suffered greatly from fires and felling. In the 70 odd years which have elapsed since then, a flourishing belt of Monica has sprung up and the ground is covered with many varieties of fern. The path, not much more than a foot wide, plunged deeper into the bush, and on either side and growing in the cr crutches of the trees were flaxen clumps of epiphytes, some of them dangling spires of creamy blossom. The sea and the cries of gulls that had given place now to the tui and the mocking song of the bellbird and fantails, which are the most inquisitive of creatures, 
hopped along beside us or fluttered about our heads. Roger had a scarlet bird lure hanging around his neck, which he rubbed between finger and thumb while we waited hopefully for a shy stitch bird to appear. We stopped by two giant Cody and waited for our breath to catch us up. We looked at the knot hole in a huge old beach and Roger rapped on the trunk to see if a moorpork were at home. But he wasn't. Thanks to Sir William Buller and my friend Dr. Reischek, I knew what a stitch bird would be like if it burst from the bush without warning. And between the two of them, they took away 150 specimens of stitch bird from Little Barrier. They are not, wrote Reischek, strong on the wing, but very active in hopping and flying. They feed on small berries and insects and suck honey from the native flowers. And then there's this little bit where she says um, that she wasn't the world's best bird watcher. And I just love the fact that, you know, there she is, kind of like me, not the world's greatest um, ornithologist. And I just kind of think, sorry about this, I should have looked at this prior. Um, and read the last little bit. The day for going home was one of such perfection that I hoped the amphibian, that's Captain Fred's seaplane, would be delayed, and it was. We sat on the shore, slapping at the sandflies and having very foolish but enjoyable conversation. Little mauve and copper-coloured moths fluttered about. We watched a gannet dive, a young shag practice landing and tumble on his backside, and a pair of pigeons move from a pahutakawa to try the berries on a puri. They flew across the bleached face of Horofenua Cliff, the sun kindling the opalescent amethyst and green on their wings and back. I looked at the colours in the boulders, some slate, some a dark coppery green, others terracotta and dove grey and a fine faded lavender, and some pale as old bones and the driftwood lying among them. Away to the south were noise and hard pavements, but they could stay where they were for a while. We still had enough time to watch the last of the day slipping down on the horizon, the trees on the point bending to the wind, Listen to the water slapping on the shore and drowse like lizards on the warm stones as if all the world were no more than this one small island. Actually, one of the really beautiful things was too that um, Ranger's children, Roger and Sue, I went back to Hotudu with them and they hadn't been back since they lived there for 15 years of their life in the 1960s and 50s. And so to take Roger, who's mentioned, and his sister to the island, and I mean, it was incredibly, um, you know, it was very heartwarming. So. Hmm. It's really nice to hear you read it in your mother's voice. I think you were channeling her very beautifully. Oh, she was, oh, yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very proud. Yes, of course. Um, how about reading us a poem from Sam Hunt and telling us a little bit about this extraordinary connection you have as his agent? Can I have to say, actually, I was asked to read a poem of his on the radio the other day, and it was a pre-record, and I felt awful about it because Sam is very particular, and I asked the man to snip it out, so I'd rather not because he is, um, you know, like, then you do, you do Sam Hunt? I mean, no, no. He no. hated John Gadsby for doing Sam Hunt with a passion, possibly was quite pleased when he, anyway, um, but I think I should probably do John Gadsby, who's not here to be crossed with me. Yes, good but idea. I'll tell you about Sam Hunt, okay. So he um, I'll find John Gadsby. was, uh, his dad was really good friends with my grandfather, mum's dad, and dad's, my grandfather was the second in command of MGM, and Sam's father, Percy, was the sort of flamboyant Queen Street lawyer who used to wander around in a top hat and a cape. And so when my parents got married. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your grandfather was that what? Was very good friends with Sam Hunt. No, 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 no. The Percy. bit about MGM. Oh, my grand, my yeah, he was the second in command of MGM here, and would bring out because like, my grandfather. <laughs> we're two Hungarians here. My grandfather worked for Warner Brothers for years and years. Oh my God, we yeah. are like film. Th I think so. Yeah. Things. Yeah, he, he directed Casablanca. <gasps> Your grandfather? Yeah. Whoa! Yeah, so he was a rival to your grandfather. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Gone with the Wind versus Casablanca. And then, though, Vivian Lee and what's-his-name came yeah, out yeah, here to yeah, do their yeah. plays. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. Wow. Because Esther, uh, Easter, I kept saying, how do you say the last na your last name? I kept calling her the wrong, Elizabeth, right, the wrong last name. It's just like the holiday. It's like the holiday, like the rabbit, she said. But then she said, Esther Housie. Esther Hazy was a uh, Hungarian. Uh -huh, Hungarian. Principal, See, but, look know. at this. Isn't Nelson a small world? Oh my God, we're probably related. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. Oh, no, I, 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 I guess I'm like, that's amazing. That's amazing. That is amazing. I feel like I can't say anything now. Um, can we talk about that? <laughs> 
Another time. Okay. Um, so my um, my grandfather. So first, Sam Hunt's father. Yeah, Sam Hunt's father was the MC at my parents' wedding. And when I was a little girl in 1970 something in Hamilton, there was a garden party, and Sam had come because he, you know, was friends with mum and dad a bit, and he was this eccentric, long-legged, stovepipe-wearing dog dude, and I really liked Minstrel, and I had no idea who Sam Hunt was and didn't really care. And then um, I bumped into him a couple of years ago, and, you know, I said, oh, my parents were really good friends with you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he got in touch like a week later and said, do you want to be my manager? I was just like, I think I was sort of um, flattered that anyone would think I could manage anything. <laughs> and also he's Sam Hunt, and I thought, well, that will be an adventure. And it was. <laughs> And he was he was lovely. I mean, he was a completely um, full of self doubts. You know, like he's not like he he was when trying to get him to do a gig or something was quite a you know you had to you know get him there. And so in the end, he decided he didn't want to be performing anymore, and that was worked out really well because I didn't want to be a manager. <laughs> but what I did get out of it was a really lovely friend who I. Um, you know, have a great deal of time for. So, but I do know that to read his work would be to have him reach out of the roof and pull me up by the top of my hair and go, Right, that probably wasn't a very good suggestion. Oh, no, you didn't, but it just it fills me with horror that he might hear a podcast, not that I imagine he oh, listens to podcasts. yeah, absolutely. And that I would be um, well, while you're, yeah, persona non grata. While you're looking for a, a suitable poem to read, um, you know, there's a lot of people here who are interested in the fact that you used to be on Shortland Street and be the evil nurse, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we just can't resist hearing a little bit about your glamorous acting past. Oh, yeah, acting's really glamorous. Yeah. Um, so tell us about that. Uh, so I, um, my first job out of drama school was playing a dinosaur in a children's television series. I played a rabbit in one. We, have, we are so related. We are. <laughs> Oh, so were you a good rabbit or a bad rabbit? No, I rabbit? was terrible. <laughs> no, no, like in that in in way you would. Oh, a, yeah, I was. A morally a, oh, sound yeah. rabbit. Yeah, I wasn't a reproducing rabbit. Oh. <laughs> no, I didn't mean like that. I just meant, did you do good? You weren't like a bad rabbit. You didn't no, play. I was a good rabbit. Did you get pulled out of a hat? <laughs> uh, no, but I sang Way Down Yonder in the Paw Paw Patch. It's tempting <laughs> to ask, Michael, and to do this, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> carry on, carry on. And, um, and which I thought was the best first job because you didn't have to wear any makeup or be seen. And I just climbed into this giant dinosaur suit. <laughs> but then my next job was um, was playing this rather sort of, she became more and more unpleasant. For them, a lot of you probably, I don't think, have ever seen Shortland Street. But um, she was the first ever killer on Shortland Street. So mm. I, um, I tried to kill my sister. I killed my husband. <laughs> I tried to frame it on um, my new boyfriend. And he died in an earthquake, and then the furniture fell on his head. And then when I realized it hadn't properly finished him off, I picked up the piece of furniture, it was a candlestick, and continued to finish him off till he was done. It was awful, awful thing to do. And I do think that sometimes when I meet people and they go, where do I know you from? <laughs> and then there's this sort of slightly thing of going, well, if they can't quite figure it out, but they know they know me, they'll know they also probably don't like me. So I always feel this slight, um, like I start on the back foot socially. Sometimes. Perhaps you saw me in a dinosaur suit. Yes, you might recognize me from my... <laughs> <laughs> I found a beautiful poem here by Loris Edmund called Kingfisher. Oh, I love and that it's one. on page 21. How about reading that one for us? I think that's us? a lovely idea. Lawrence Edmund was... Um, that's the great thing about this book too. There's some people in it that are so fabulously, extraordinarily, enormously fabulous. And I think, oh my God, I've put these people, Honey Tufari and Loris Edmund, into a book. Oh, what page did you say? <laughs> Uh, 21. 21, lovely, thank you. Because when I was at university, she would um, lecture us in New Zealand poetry, and I was quite starstruck by her that these people would come and talk to us. And, and yeah, anyway, Loris, and, and that kingfisher happens to be my favourite bird, the kotari. Weary majesty, you reign by vivid absence, peacock titillation. Poised upon your high trapeze, you lure as you deny. Fulfillment waiting till we turn away. Then in the dim humility of loss, we miss an incandescent streak across the afternoon. I think that one's lovely. Mm, it's nothing like a good poem. Mm. Mm, nothing like a good poem. I know so much you can do in so few words. Mm, mm, mm. Um, now, there was something else I wanted to ask you, just a sec. Uh, we're just about to question time, I think, but not quite. 
Am I right in thinking it's quarter past two? No, it's Pardon me? <laughs> What's wrong? No, 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 that's very sweet. No, oh. <laughs> I was almost taken in by that. <laughs> <laughs> Time doesn't fly when you're having fun. <laughs> no, no, no. So sorry, I'm just trying to think of... Um, I didn't expect you to speak so quickly. And I oh, th- yes, sorry. I do talk really fast. I, I imagine everybody listens very fast. One of the, one of the um, interesting conversations we had yesterday um, was about being a writer and we were sort of I was saying oh I bet you didn't make any money from this book did you and Elizabeth was saying oh are you kidding and and so on so I think for a lot of people there's a kind of mystique about being a writer and we'd like to disabuse you of that (laughs) tell us about being a writer and the writer's process the writer's life the life of the freelance creative person uh, Good and, and bad. In, the, in that conversation too, I, I quoted a thing I'd read in the New Yorker recently, which I liked so much I remembered it, which is a rare thing these days. And um, it said, it's never been easier to be a writer. It's never been harder to make a living. And I feel um, really, really glad, lucky, something like that, that I am doing mostly all the things I love. There's nothing that I go to do each day that I sort of drag myself to. And I, for whatever reason, possibly because I started as an actor, I had to have lots of other things on the go, else I would have been a very sad person. I might still be sometimes. And so I took up writing as my secondary career, which is so stupid. And I should have taken up something more, resp- you know, like more reliable. But so hairdressing. Oh my gosh! Everybody needs a hair. Apparently, air traffic control is a um, is a job for people that you know you start at quite a good wicket. But anyway, I wouldn't be responsible enough. But um, so <laughs> writing oh for magazines and newspapers. Like when I was on Shortland Street, this is one of the good things of Shortland Street. And I'm so glad I'm not a famous person in this modern world of of social media and people filming you. Um, and putting you on the internet and whatever you say or do is wrong. You know, if you, in, you you would just not win. You would be forever on show and it would be horrible. But in Shortland Street then, I remember I had written a few stories for the Dominion. I'd had a column in the Dominion under a pseudonym. I don't know how I got that either. And I went to the editor of the Herald in Auckland and I said, I'd quite like a column. I have some things I'd like to say in that sort of rambunctious way of the early 20s. And he, um, possibly with a little bit of the Harvey Weinsteins but no massage oil, said, yeah, sure, do it. (laughs) And I got a column on the op-ed page of the Herald just like that, which I had for a couple of years. And then so I used that to leverage my way into all sorts of places. You know, I said, oh, I've got a column in the Herald. You know, and so today I write for um, maybe 25 different magazines and newspapers around the world. And I, it doesn't pay an enormous amount, but I, I make perfectly enough to be able to stay at home and write and go on, you know, travel trips to, um, you know, travel writing is one of the things I do the most of now. And it is as amazing as you think it would be. It's just lovely. It's really hard not to like a trip that didn't cost you anything. You know, if you've spent $4,000 on a five-day trip around the Galapagos, you might be inclined to want a bit more, but when you're just there because you're writing about it. And it's so it's absolutely lovely. So it's not the... Um, there, I mean, you know, and this book, for example, was virtually negligible in pay, but the pleasure I got from doing it um, was... There's no way I wouldn't... Every now and then I think about doing something else and, and having some responsible, solid career that won't let me down, but I don't write because I, I write because I really, really want to. And while I didn't write this, I, um, you know, I want to be with words. That's what I want to do for my life. And so I feel really lucky in this world where it's hard to make a living that I somehow do. Yeah, I love that. I want to be with words. Isn't that good? Yeah. And I guess you're here because you like to be with words too. So, kia ora. Hmm, I think I've run out of questions for you. Is there anything oh, yes. brilliant that you can say oh, that gosh. I haven't thought of um, uh, that you want to talk about? <laughs> Otherwise, perhaps somebody uh, in the back has a question. Here's a question. I have a question about what helped you to decide what to put in the book and what to leave out. Oh, that's a lovely question. So what, what did, how did Thank I you. choose? How did I make the selections? That's actually, yes, because I'd never done an anthology before. And it's all very well when you say, say to somebody, you know, it's like when I think of work very much as fishing. I bait 
heaps of hooks and I lose a lot of bait, but every now and then I catch a fish. And sometimes a fish like this, it's like, oh my God, I don't even know how to cook it. I don't know if I'm going to get it on the boat. And so I just slowly started collecting and collecting and things that people sent me and, and reading widely and asking people. And then I made three memory sticks or big documents. And one was kind of like, no. And one was, I quite like these, but I'm not sure if I like them or if they have, because I don't necessarily trust my, I mean, I trust my judgment for my own self. I know when I like a book, but how much is a book likable for other people? And then I had a bunch of ones that I just loved and absolutely felt were very strong. And so I gave them to the lovely woman at Ram, Random Penguin House, um, Harriet, the fiction editor, and I let her decide. And I let her see all of them, even the ones that I thought were, because I thought maybe I don't like this one, but there's still, you know, like maybe I'm having a reaction to it because it's good. You know, I just, I didn't trust myself. And she was great because she came back with spreadsheets and I don't do spreadsheets. And, and she also was very good about, you know, go, okay, what's our sort of our gender split? What's our um, cultural split to make sure that it wasn't just one, you know, because I'm a certain type of demographic, that it wasn't just my people. And it was a really, we worked out that the, um, the shortlist that she made from my watch um, and then that was refined but it was really nice not being alone because almost most of the work I do I tend to be relatively isolated and then I suddenly had this this teammate who helped me and I loved what she picked there were one or two that I um, was sad to see go but I, I got that she felt like you know you can't have that many tui you can only have that many of certain sorts of birds and also I liked um, when we got to the thing of putting them in order which is really complex. It's like doing a jigsaw, but there's no rules. And we looked at some arbitrary things like alphabetical. That didn't work. So we tried alphabetical backwards. <laughs> that didn't work. That didn't work. <laughs> and so it really made sense to start with Whittier Hamida's piece, which starts with In the Beginning and is a creation um, mythology of the, you know, of the birds of New Zealand. And then slowly, slowly, bit by bit, they kind of, rolled nicely and then ending with the poem by the very youngest writer Abby Mason who is amazing would you like to read that one yeah it's really cool she is um she sent in two poems and this one was the one that got the um she also sent in one about a kingfisher as well so this is the one about the bellbird because otherwise Loris would be you know they'd have to compete bellbird a bellbird perches on the lonely pine tree the beech trees sigh. The breeze searches the forest. A lonely call echoes the silence. The trees turn their leaves, halting their breath. The wind pauses. The bellbird calls again and again. The wind continues on its way. The beech trees exhale. The bellbird continues to sing. Amazing. She wrote it when she was 10. Oh dear. I know, I'm actually going to think, oh well. <laughs> oh well, we'll hear more from her then. That's mm -hmm. great. Are there any other questions um, from this lovely audience? Here's something, yes? Have you ever had a relationship with a particular bird? A relationship with a particular bird. That's a very... That's a very personal question. That's a very personal <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've got a deep, I have chicken envy, but I've not, I've yet to sort of consummate that relationship with uh, genuine chickens. But I, um, I feel like the, when I see a kotari, a kingfisher, I always feel slightly lucky, you know, like I go, I make a wish. I know that sounds really um, pointless, but I, I actually, I do do a lot of wishing because I think it galvanizes what you want. Like sometimes when I have the opportunity to wish, so I wish on kotari. And I love when I see them in flight, and I've got a couple near my house. And so, yeah, I mean, the personal relationships more happen, um, seem to be about what's in my neighborhood. Like, I, there's a more pork in my um, area, and I really want to, I want to find out exactly where he or she is. And, um, yeah, oh, oh, yes, I do. Once I held Sirocco, and we fell in love. And it was amazing. And then I saw him a couple of years later, and I think he, he, he sort of strutted for me and when I held him and I had to wear a blue dungaree suit and white gumboots and even through that costume I could tell that he knew that I was for him. <laughs> <laughs> 
You never told the story about June Carson and the... Oh, that was the loveliest thing. Because when we saw June yesterday... Um, this is the woman who was... Um, Perrine Moncrief's, um, you know, felt very sort of to daughterly daughter. by it to her. And we were all saying that we would probably see her or some way because also Perrine was very into spiritualism and vitalism and seances and things so we thought if anyone's going to come back and say you know hello 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 you're doing a play in Nelson and what do I think about it yeah (laughs) yeah, please like it and um, we were out in June's Carson Carson's garden as we were saying goodbye and up in the hills above her house there was wheeling a hawk and she hadn't seen one, and she's lived there for a you know, mighty long time, since the 40s. She hasn't seen one for a couple of decades. And we all agreed that that was Perrine in the sky. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions? There's something back there, yes? Oh, yeah, they all got probably in terms of effort more than me. Um, but that's fine, because I didn't do it for obviously that reason. So we, um, everybody got a... I wonder if I should say, a reasonable amount of money for something that they'd already written. And I believe it's a one-off payment because otherwise it becomes too complicated. Perrine was the only person whose next of kin we couldn't find, although I believe I could find her lawyer after Friday. And um, so a donation was made to Forest and Bird and the same for Lily Daff um, to sort of offset any, but also if they came forward and we would, they, they would also be paid. So yeah, everyone got paid. That was another lovely thing. It wasn't to like be in my book. It's going to be of no consequence to you, but they won't get rich. Yes, sir. Oh, so a question for both, really. It doesn't get easier to write as you get older. There's more to write about, is there? He asked, does it get easier as you get older? Huh. Does it? No, does it? no you, you're on, it's, for, it's about you. Um, it becomes more entrenched. So I don't, if I, it, the first time you ever say you're an actor, you probably have to have been doing it for four or five years not to actually feel like a fraud. But as a writer, I feel like it's the thing I've been doing the longest. It's what I put on the forms when I come in and out of the country as my occupation. Mm, mm, so I feel it's what I am and I don't feel like I'm, you know, pretending to be something I'm not. As for becoming easier, it's always hard Every single story I write, write, whether it's a little short piece for North and South or a long piece for, you know, thousands of words, it always starts off and I wonder what on earth I thought I was doing taking it on and I spend a couple of days on it hating it and then one day I wake up and I look at it and go, oh, it's not far from, oh, oh, look, I'll just put the end at the front and I'll take that out and I'll spell, oh, it's done, you know, so it's always, it always feels, (laughs) you'd think it would be, (laughs) but I always like it even though it's hard. It's a very strange relation. It's kind of like an abusive relationship, isn't it? <laughs> we break up, we get back together. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> oh, isn't there more to write about? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. And I think sometimes you look at the stuff you wrote earlier and go, oh. <laughs> That's a bit But awkward. I think when you're a young writer, nothing stops you. You don't realise what you don't know. And so there's a lot of confidence you just bowl into things oh I can do that whereas uh, as you get older and you you perhaps realize you don't know everything and there's a a kind of ambivalence that you have to grapple with with your work Mm. and also to no amount of rejection as much as I have wounds that have been licked a lot it just doesn't stop me it's a very that's also perverse you know, it's like I just, I don't, I don't find that, if anything, sometimes a rejection can be incredibly galvanizing. It's like, well, I'll show you. <laughs> You'll be sorry you yeah. ever turned you me wait, down. You wait. You just, just you wait, wait Henry Higgins. I'm on the board of something deciding <laughs> about you. <laughs> and I would be gracious. Uh-huh. Yes, kindness. Um, well, I think we're almost to the end. Is there, is there another, one more question? Yes. Writing requires a lot less sucking in of your stomach. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, I mean, they're both lovely. Acting is something that you don't get a lot of say over when you get to do it, whereas I can write every day nonstop and no one can stop me, whereas the acting is usually requiring, you know, I mean, yes, you can put on plays and things, but so writing is more accessible. 
but um, I like the acting. The lovely thing about being in something is that you just rock up and you someone else rocks you up and you learn your lines, which is, you know, quite simple still. And so th I like different things about them. But acting's actually really, 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 really boring because most of the time you're just sitting around waiting to do this little bit and then you repeat it over and over again and it takes kind of the, yeah. You know what's going to be great is you actually are able to write your own show and be in it with the Perrine show, Birds of a Feather. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a yes. bingo, bingo situation, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, my God. I'll get the royalties and the... <laughs> <laughs> it's never looked so good. <laughs> We need to look at Charlie Unwin. I'm looking at Charlie. Oh, he's gone. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> he just dipped out the back. I'm, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a, um, it, I mean, it could be relative. It depends how the momentum outside of me gets. Because if somebody said, oh, we wanted it for this, and there was a, you know, a, a carrot, then I would, yeah, I would probably get cracking. I think we can say there's a lot of interest and things are looking positive. Oh, I like that. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's a very political answer, isn't it? <laughs> Without committing ourselves. Yes. yes. But I'd love to come here. I'd love to come here and I'd like to do it here first because I feel like um, yesterday felt like it just felt very at home. Yeah. One more. Horribly. Sometimes I feel so utterly lonely and I have lots of friends and I have, you know, a child and a cat and birds in my garden. But I, yeah, I, I really struggle with that sometimes. But then I, you know, I fill the time. But there are times when I just would like afterwards, at after the end of a really good day or a bad day or a, any, any day, any day, <laughs> have someone to say, well, guess what happened today? Guess how many people said no to me today? <laughs> It'd be really nice. So you said as um, a thing, but I do think you get to a point of isolation where the only thing you can do is write. If I was surrounded by activity and distraction, maybe I'd do nothing. So I think that's part of the process. It can be quite painful. Mm. I should be paying you for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you can't write by committee, and you have to. You do have to sit down and do it, and be by yourself. Mm. Mm. Yeah. With encouragement. Sometimes I find myself talking to myself when I'm actually out of the house. <laughs> it's like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a most delightful session. It's been so much fun to talk to Elizabeth and hear, you know, she has such a wonderful joy of life. I love it. And, um, and you've been a lovely audience. Thank you for being so attentive. Thank you, Michael. And I want to thank you. That was lovely. And also you lovely people from Yeah. And so, you know, we can thank everyone. And um, yeah, we'll say, we'll say, not good night, good afternoon.